Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Nancy, for 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 inviting me. Thank you to uh, uh, the always mysterious Steve Williams uh, uh, for for uh, helping produce these, and everybody else, Edwin, and everybody else who's who's involved. Um, uh, it is uh, always an honor to be able to to talk with you here. Uh, at these events, and uh, uh, I'm excited that uh, that I, I get to do it one more time. Um, the Hold on one one sec. I want to jump in and remind people: if you're watching on YouTube, we may have some interactivity available for you when it gets to question time. So uh, be aware that you can interact with us inside the Zoom room or via YouTube. There you go. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so the way we're going to do this, uh, is I'm going to speak for probably about half an hour. I've got some notes or, to go through, uh, and then, uh, we'll take questions. Uh, you can put quest any questions you have at any point into the chat. Uh, just say question for Jared and, uh, my colleague, uh, Angela is going to collect them all up, and then when we uh, when we get to the Q and A, uh, and she's looking at the YouTube chat too, so uh, at the at the comments, so you can put your questions there too, and um, when uh, when we uh, get to the Q and A, if you're in the Zoom room, I'll actually ask you to to unmute and you and I can have a conversation about the question. If we take it from YouTube, that's not gonna work. I don't have a way to, to do that, but we'll we'll figure something out. We'll, we'll, Angela will ask your question on your behalf and we'll go from there. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, so I think that's that's all the, the business uh, part of this. So let's, let's just get to the, to the meat of the thing. Um, I was thinking about this presentation and what I keep coming back to is uh, this a, a particular television episode from my childhood. Uh, uh, I'm thinking of uh, the show, I Love Lucy. And there's there was this uh, episode where um, Lucy and Ethel, for some reason that I, have no recollection of found themselves in a um, uh, working in a chocolate factory, and there uh, there's a particular scene in the chocolate factory where they're uh, uh, sort of working at this uh, uh, conveyor belt uh, and. Uh, Lucy and and Ethel uh, uh, are there, and and there's the conveyor belt is is built into a a, a, a wall, and they have the 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 sort of responsibility. That's not what I want to more like that. Uh, uh, they they have the responsibility of of. Uh, dealing with chocolates as it as they come down the conveyor belt, and the uh, the chocolates are are coming through, and they're supposed to take each chocolate and wrap it up in a in a little wrapper and send it on down uh, uh, back into the hole uh, for it to go someplace else, and they're told by whoever it is who, who is managing them, supervising them, that, that they can't let any chocolates go through unwrapped. And at first, it, it seems quite uh, reasonable. They're, they, they're not having trouble. That seems like a pretty easy job. But pretty soon, the, the number of chocolates starts to increase and they start to fall behind on the wrappings and uh, and the the speed of the belt starts to get faster and and faster and and faster and and they they can't keep up and this 
this phenomena of of making sure that chocolate trapped it you, you know quickly becomes hilarious in that they have to you know they they don't want to let any chocolates go through unwrapped so they start shoving them into their pockets and they they're wearing hats and they start putting them into the hats and and they shove them into their mouths and and it's it's uh uh and the reason i'm telling you about all this is that this is what modern day ux practice sort of feels like uh uh it's it's become this sort of conveyor belt of work where you have to go faster and faster and faster you have to get all your research done you have to get all your wireframes built you have to get all your personas done before the sprint ends and and if you don't do that you get yourself into a lot of trouble and and that's the the problem here is that is that we've created this sort of feature factory uh approach to building things uh some of that is uh, uh uh an outcome of of the move to agile but a lot of it is just this notion that everything's about the production of features and everything about ux is making sure we deliver features the the idea that that we're now all sort of product designers um means that what we work on are products and we deliver products that's what comes out the end of the conveyor belt and all of this uh uh leaves us at this place where we are in many ways uh just sort of trying to keep up as best we can and falling behind and it's demoralizing there's it, it, you don't have to work really hard to find any number of of twitter threads or linkedin posts of people who are just on the verge of giving up or potentially already have given up in order to uh 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 because they just this is not what they signed up for this is not the work that they they wanted to do and they find this incredibly uh frustrating and draining and and exhausting not energizing at all and that's the the feeling that that we're seeing a lot of people have and part of this is because uh the ux practice in general has sort of gravitated to these deliverables right that that we spend our time uh uh building personas um and running usability tests uh and uh creating uh wireframes and uh filling up figma files uh and all of these these things are are uh are basic just sort of uh deliverables for what the work is and if you ask people what does a ux person do they start to list all these things and say well i do personas and i run usability tests and i create wireframes and i do figma files and i create design systems and and uh it's always about the deliverables journey maps that's another one that we do a lot of and uh the thing about all of these things is that they are basically outputs right what we are what we are sort of reconciled to at this point are are producing outputs for our work uh but the thing about outputs is that there's uh there's no notion of quality in an output right we can't tell if the personas are good personas if they match who our users really are if they have something that actually uh 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 matches the people that we're trying to work with in fact personas themselves tend to be quite problematic i'm realizing that this is probably unreadable 
the font I've chosen for tonight is sans uh, legibility. I apologize for that. Um, the, uh, uh, but there's no notion of, of quality in an output. It, uh, we can't tell if the designs in the Figma file are any good, if the design system is effective. That's a separate condition of what's going on. And the problem with outputs is that is that they are uh, uh, they're just basically the the practice of of producing something and sending it out the window on the other side of the wall. We don't have a good sense at all as to whether what is happening there, what whether that's that's having any sort of important impact on the world. And so in, what we found is what we wanna focus on instead of outputs are outcomes. Outcomes, unlike outputs, are not what we deliver. Outcomes are the, the change uh, that happens in the world because of what we deliver. And the thing about outcomes is that because it's a change, change can go in, in one of two directions. We can either change for the, for the better, or we can change for the worse. And so it's inherent in change as to whether we have added quality or not. This is built into the notion of change. And so instead of thinking in terms of outputs, what we find uh, is that more successful UX leaders are now beginning to focus on outcomes. And that the outcomes that they're focusing on are outcomes that are basically uh, uh, a, a positive change in the world. And this shift is a shift from uh, what we call being reactive, where we're in this chocolate factory and we have no control over the chocolates that are being put onto the conveyor belt. We just have to, we just have to make sure that none of them go unwrapped as they move out of the conveyor belt. And so we're at the complete mercy of, of who or whatever is on this side of the wall without having any way to talk about it. And that, that's a reactive situation where we find out uh, about what we're working on, like the day the project starts, and we're then told that the sprint is gonna be two weeks long or three weeks long or whatever the time box quantity is. And we have to do these things in that period. And it's basically being locked into the, that, uh, a sort of chocolate factory conveyor belt of things. And we don't get a chance to, to ask the question, how do we make things better? The focus on outcomes, this is proactive because this starts with a question. And the question is, if we do a great job on this feature or on this product or on this service, whatever it is, how will we improve someone's life? This is what we call a UX outcome. The answer to this question is a UX outcome. 
if we do a great job, how will we improve someone's life? As I mentioned, a uh, an outcome can either make something better or worse. And nobody I know who works in UX intentionally tries to make things worse. So we're always looking at the improvement. What is the improvement that we can make to someone's life? And so the um, uh, the outcome that we focus on turns out to be a uh, uh, a a question that uh, 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 that or the answer to this question, this this idea that uh, when we are working at our best, we better be improving someone's life. After all, if we're not improving someone's life, why are we doing this work? What is the point of doing this if, uh, 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 if, if it's not gonna make some difference in the lives of, of somebody? And this question, changes everything. If you start asking this question, you will notice a change in your organization because it will be the first time that we are actually talking about something human-centered in that process that isn't forced. It, it brings this intention. And we're not talking about UX. We're not explaining why we do personas or why we do usability tests or why we create these Figma files with layers and why we do journey maps. We're, we're talking about if we do a great job, how do we improve somebody's life? And so this turns out to be a game-changing uh, question. and. That's, um, uh, that's, that's sort of the core of, of what we're talking about here. Now, the way we get to the answer here, there's a bunch of ways we can get to the answer, but the one that, that, that I'm gonna focus on tonight is, is this idea that we have to start by understanding someone's experience. So think about your product, think about your service, think about the experience that somebody has. And there's a chance that that, that experience unfolds over time. And so there's a bunch of things that that person does with your product or does uh, uh, to accomplish their goals and your product somehow plays a role in that. Uh, there's a bunch of these things and each of these sort of vertical lines that I'm drawing here uh, represents something that they do, some milestone in the process of, of, of accomplishing whatever their goal is. And we can measure that by actually watching a real person. So we're gonna go watch a real person. Person's name is Edna. And, and Edna's real. Edna's not some imaginary person, not some arbitrary archetype, some synthesis of all the people we've ever met. Um, uh, Edna's a real person. We've gone and we, we're sitting with Edna and we're watching Edna uh, uh, go through these various steps. And we can see Edna uh, uh, walking through each of these steps, doing what Edna does. And we can, we can measure what Edna is doing on a scale of extreme frustration to extreme delight. And in the process of watching Edna, what we see is, is whatever the first step to this thing is, let's say she's booking her ideal vacation somewhere, uh, uh, she gets to the website that has 
uh, uh, possible places for her to stay. Uh, uh, that's somewhat delightful for her. But then over time, uh, uh, the next step starts to get frustrating because she can't tell whether she's near the center of town or not. Uh, she also gets very frustrated because she can't get a clear answer as to whether the rooms that she's staying at are non-smoking rooms. The last time she stayed at, at uh, some place, the room just reeked of smoke and it made her, her allergies flare up and, and she was just miserable for her entire vacation. So she's very sensitive. She wants a guarantee of some sort that there's not going to be smoke in the room. Uh, uh, left over from a previous guest, but she finds the room and and decides that she's going to book it anyways, and and so that's that's fine. But then when she gets into the booking process, uh, uh, suddenly it starts complaining about her credit card. It doesn't like her credit card. Uh, she gets an error message because it, it for some reason. Uh, in 2023, we still complain that phone numbers are not allowed to have spaces or dashes, even though computers could easily fix that. Uh, uh, but she makes it through the booking process and, and it turns delightful again and she gets excited about her vacation. And so we can map out on this, this simple journey here uh, uh, of Edna uh, uh, what parts of it were frustrating for Edna and what parts of it were, were delightful for Edna. And we can easily see when that happens. And that gives us a sense as to, as to what Edna's current experience is. So this line represents uh, her current experience. And that idea of the current experience is key because it's from that idea that we can then ask the question, well, what if we made this experience delightful for Edna all the way across? What, what if every step of this process of, of booking this, this vacation was absolutely delightful. She, she could tell how close to the center of town it was. She could see that the room is guaranteed to not have any remnants of smoke in it. Uh, the checkout process uh, or, the, or the, the booking process uh, took her credit card, took her phone number without complaint. We could, we could even see how the they could provide better pictures, how they could uh, uh, give her more reassurance on the quality of the stay. Uh, and what we're trying to do is raise all this frustration and get to this ideal experience. And the, the important thing here is that this is, is an aspirational experience that's gonna take us a bit of work to get to, but we can now see it in contrast to the experience that Edna had. Of course, we're not going to just look at Edna's experience and decide what to build. We're going to go out and we're, we're going to look at a bunch of people's experiences. And we're going to see what all their experiences are like. And we're going to see that some people have radically different experiences, but other people have experiences that feel very similar in lots of ways. And so what we're going to see from this is, you know, this is, this is Jessica's experience, and this is Paul's experience, and this is Irina's experience. And, and what we're going to see from all of these experiences is that there are some patterns that emerge that, in fact, yeah, there is a pattern around the room descriptions not being clear about certain things that people find important in their stays. And there is a pattern around the uh, checkout process, uh, giving error messages that are problematic uh, because people don't can't predict what the what the database wants for certain types of data. And so we can we can see that those patterns happen so that this aspirational experience actually would not only um, 
be better for Adna, but it would reduce support calls and maybe it would get more completed bookings. There'd be fewer drop-offs. So we can, we can see that by collecting up data qualitatively and then potentially mapping onto it some signals we get from quantitative data that these experiences could be improved. But the important thing to, to, to note here is that we are looking at Edna's experience. That's what we're studying. We're not studying the product. This is not a description of the product. This is a description of the experience that Edna has. And in fact, we could, we could start our map of Edna's experience way before she uses the product when she's just thinking about where she wants to go on vacation. And we could continue beyond this, looking at her actual stay and seeing how the promises that were made on the website mapped the stay that she actually had. And so we, could, we can look at the whole experience all the way across. And, and we're not constrained by the bounds of the product. And it's, it's that perception of what the current experience looks like that allows us to start to see what the UX outcome could be. Because that current experience that Edna had, where we could see that there were frustrating bits and delightful bits, and we could ask the question, what would it look like if it was delightful all the way across? That, that answer to being delightful, that becomes our UX outcome. If we do a great job on Edna's experience, how do we improve Edna's life? And that's the thing we're shooting for. We have succeeded when we have approved Edna's life. And so this idea that uh, uh, there's a current experience, which is, you know, we could think of as a baseline experience for where we are today. And this, this outcome, this future experience that we want to achieve, that's, that's what we're talking about. Now, in the feature factory, the first thing we jump to is, is some sort of solution, right? What does it look like? What is the product? What are we going to build? What is the thing that we're going to ship? And that solution is, is important. I mean, we have to ship something in order to get to the outcome. But it's not the end of the journey. The end is attaining the outcome not delivering the output. The solution is an output. And so we don't want to jump there quickly. In fact, the first thing we want to do is we want to ask the question, what's preventing Edna? Because remember, this is all about Edna. We're keeping this human-centered. And Edna's the human we're putting in the center. What's preventing Edna from getting these outcomes today by herself without us doing anything? And that becomes uh, the, the problems that we have to solve. We can literally make a list. Uh-oh, my purple pen is dying. Well, goodbye purple pen. Hello, new purple pen. Uh, uh, so what is preventing uh, Edna from getting this? Well, there's a list of problems. I mean, it's literally a list. And so we create the list of problems that Edna, uh, that we need to solve in order for Edna to get the outcome. That's informed from the current experience. That informs the solution we want to build. And 
that hopefully generates the outcome. But we're iterating, right? We're, we're in design mode, we're iterating, and it may not get the outcome. But if it doesn't get the outcome, what happens is it informs our list of problems to solve. We now know that we have more definition to the problems that we have to solve. And so, you know, we, because I see Indy in the audience, you know, this, uh, uh, this here is what we might call the problem space. And this area here is the solution space. But notice that the outcome exists outside of the problem space or the solution space. The outcome is, is this change in the world that happens when we have improved Edna's life. And one way to think about all this is that it's a, it's a, a goal of a good organization, a, a really truly human-centered focused organization to become the world's foremost experts in the problems and the current experience. There's an old saying, which is uh, uh, great designers don't fall in love with their solutions. Great designers fall in love with the problems. It's the list of problems that we're trying to, to solve that we want to fall in love with. And we can only fall in love with that when we really understand the experience that Edna's having, that Jessica's having, that Paul's having, that Arena's having, all of these things inform our expertise. And there's absolutely no reason why our organizations can't be the world's foremost experts in the problems that our users have that we have to solve. This absolutely is how we say, we, we don't wanna be experts in solutions, solutions come and go. I mean, we, we have to know about them, we have to know how they work, we have to know how to build them, but that's not where our true expertise needs to be built. Our expertise needs to be built in the current experience and the problems that have to be solved. And so that's sort of this, this diagram here is what we call the schematic. And the schematic is, you know, this is the UX outcome schematic. And it, it basically recommend, rec, uh, represents, I'm going to blame everything on East Coast time. That's what I'm going to do. It basically represents what our, we need to think about in order to make sure that we are being proactive. If we work purely on solutions, we're reactive. In fact, um, uh, uh, Jen Cardello at Fidelity uh, talks about how when she got to Fidelity, she found that 85% of her team's work was being focused on solutions and that less than 15% was being focused, she heads up research for Fidelity. So 15% so of the research efforts were being spent on understanding the user's experience and the problems they have to solve. She spent a year reversing that, pushing them so that 85% of their effort was understanding the experience and the problems and less than 15% was understanding the solutions. And they saw a dramatic increase in the quality of the products they produced and the improvements they were making to the lives of their customers, their brokers, all the people involved. So there's real business rewards to, to doing this. And 
in the process of doing this, because the focus is on the experience that real people are having, we are making the whole process more human centered. And we're doing it without lecturing people on what it means to be human centered. We don't have to define usability, UX, human centered design. We don't have to define any of those things. All we have to do is ask the question, if we do a great job, how do we improve somebody's life? That's the only question we have to answer. And that changes everything. What we're doing when we're, when we're working on this is this aspirational experience is in essence a vision. And a vision is key to leadership. Leaders lead by having a vision that people want to follow. And, and the easiest way I found to sort of talk about a vision is we can think about a, uh, uh, where we are today. So this point is, is today. And uh, uh, if we proceed the way we've been proceeding and we do nothing different, we're going to get to another point you know, some time in the future. And, you know, it could be a year from now, it could be two years from now, it could be 15 years from now, it doesn't really matter. And this future point is going to be the same as today if we do nothing different. If we just keep being reactive and keep up, do our best to just keep working in the feature factory, you know, the chocolate conveyor belt, if we just keep doing that, we're gonna end up, we have a bunch of problems today that we aren't solving and we're gonna have exactly the same problems in the future, unsolved. But people who are leaders, in particular UX leaders, they can imagine a better future. And that better future is a point that is, well, better. And that better future is, is not today. It solves these problems. The problems here are solved. And it's the difference between this future, this better future, and the world that we have today that makes up the vision. Right? It's our ability to describe the difference between the future that happens if we do nothing different and the future that happens if we decide to be better. And the important point to note here is that we're not describing the work we're going to do to get there. We're just describing the better future. We have to come up with a future that's so much better that everybody gets excited. If we can generate excitement about this better future, then people get bought into it. And it's then and only then that we can have a conversation about what is the path that we're going to have to take as an organization to get to that better future. And this path is when we do something different than what we've been doing. And so that's what's key. Where a lot of UX people get trapped is they start to talk about what, we're, what we need to be doing differently without establishing up front what the better future looks like. And of course, doing something different is, seems expensive and costly and, and hard to imagine. So 
nobody buys into it. They just want to keep doing what we've been doing because they can't see the difference. We have to help them see the difference of this better future. We have to get them to see that first, get them to, to want it so much that they're willing to do all the things, all the hard work to get there. And the UX leaders who I see do this, do this by turning back to Edna's experience because that better future is this aspirational experience. And it's because we've done a fantastic job of showing how miserable we make Edna's life today with the choices we have made. And so what we wanna do is to make different choices, come up with an aspirational experience that leads us to a better future. And that better future will not only be better for Edna, but it'll be better for Jessica and Paul and Irina, and so much better that people will pay for it because it adds value. The buzzword in business these days is value adding. And we in UX can talk specifically to value adding because if we eliminate the frustration and increase the delight, we get people to pay more for the things that we do. And that's how we get to a better future. And everything we do, our roadmaps, our metrics, uh, everything we do, has to be outcome driven. Has to have that future. If we do a good job, how are we improving people's lives? Those are the outcomes. We should be able to point to everything in the roadmap and ask the question, if we do a great job on that thing, how will it improve somebody's life? If we can't answer that question, why, are we, why is it on the roadmap? Every single one of our metrics has to be measuring the improvement in people's lives. Have we improved it or not? If we can't, if our metrics don't tell us whether we've improved someone's life or not, why are we tracking it? Everything has to go back to this idea that there's a list of problems to solve in order to get the outcome. Do we have a shared understanding of that, those problems? And here's the thing, the people we work with, the developers, the product managers, if they have that shared understanding, they, they look past the solution, and they focus on the problems. The solution is just a temporary means to an end. We'll have a better solution to solve the problems after the one we ship today. We don't fall in love with our solutions, we fall in love with our problems. And that's the process. What we're doing here is we're adding meaning Meaning, a way to define meaning in someone's work is by doing my work, do I improve someone else's life? That's meaningful. Am I making the world a better place for others with the work that I do? The more meaning we put into the workplace, the more excited people get about doing that. And we've done all of this without ever having to define UX, without ever having to fight to get UX practices into place. All of that happens because we have added meaning to the work. And that's what I came to talk to you about. Uh, we'll take some questions. 
uh, just put them in the chat. Uh, and uh, uh, and then we'll we'll see what we can do. Uh, in the meantime, the uh, we have a, a community where I talk about these things all the time. Uh, it's called Leaders of Awesomeness, and uh, it's free. Uh, you can join it. There are 44,000 UX leaders in this community. I wasn't, I'm not hyperbolizing actually. It's, I, I over, I did, I did exaggerate a little. It's 43,841 as of this morning. Uh, uh, but uh, we have that many UX leaders in this community and you can join it for free. And we have conversations every week about how do we accomplish the types of things that, that I've been talking about here. And so, uh, uh, including live, uh, every Monday we have a live Talk UX strategy session where two to 300 people come and we, we talk through these types of things. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can check out Leaders of Awesomeness. Uh, but uh, for now, um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions or even happier if, if, if we don't have any questions and I can, I can get to bed. But it looks like we're going to have a question here. So it looks like we're going to have a few. So uh, uh, Angela, uh, why don't you help me out here? Let's start with, with the first question. Okay. Um, Mary Park's question is, uh, what about when we're working on something new, how does the process you're describing change? Well, that's a great question. Mary, can you say a little bit more about that? Maybe you can unmute and, and add a little context here. Um, yeah, so... Um... First of all, yay, I love the talk. Um, oh, good. Would you like? <laughs> it's very inspiring, actually. Um, yeah, so uh, a lot of times, you know, I, I work in voice interaction design, and a lot of times the products are new. Um, it's not an existing product. And so um, I, I have ideas about, based on what you're saying, that I'm, I'm very, you know, how I would modify the process for something that's new, where we, where we can't say what's the current experience. But I'm, I would love to hear what you're. So say a little bit more about what these products do for people. I mean, I understand that they're voice user interfaces, but my guess is nobody wakes up in the morning excited to because they're going to get to talk to a computer. What what are they actually using this for? Uh, just for one example, like let's say. Um, my hands are busy, so I'm going to be using speech at a distance to something to retrieve information, for example. What, what kind of information? Uh, I want to know who won. I didn't get to watch the Oscars, and I want to know who won. You know, Okay. Uh, something like that. And uh, I'm having a conversation. And it, you know, the typical far field um, speech recognition thing would be you know you're having a conversation with someone and uh you just want to get a quick answer to it there's no screens around so there's right. a device that you could talk to at a distance basically settling bar bets which is but my my amazon echo does three things in my house it's <laughs> It turns on and off lights. It's a kitchen timer, and it settles bar bets. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, uh, it's the most expensive bar bet setting device. Right, I but I'm only bringing that up like like that's what I typically work in. But I'm sure there's like you know a million different things that are new, right? So in that case, how would it, how would? But none of that's new. That's my point. Hmm. You're focused on the product, not the experience. Mm -hmm. The experience is the same experience. People have been settling bar bets since the bar was invented. Mm. And so 
Um, uh, the, the, uh, you know, my guess is Socrates and Plato wanted to, you know, were making bets and, and hoping someone had had a, a way to look up the answer. The, the, um, uh, th this is not a new experience. There are virtually no new experiences. There are just new ways to do the experiences. And so, so can I bring up another product then, just as another example? Sure. That was kind of, uh, another example would be speech synthesis that is used in multiple places. And we're trying to create speech synthesis that is has certain qualities to it that will make it easier to understand, easier to to process what you're hearing, that type of thing. Um, right. That could be another example of something that, that's that's not only found in those like, you know, like an Amazon Echo type things, but might be found in a lot of places. So just speech synthesis as a category, um, that would be another example. Sure, but it's what is the experience, right? Is it speech synthesis in a noisy train station, sort of like, you know, the BART announcements? and and is uh, uh, is that um, the uh, the context that we're talking about, or is this speech synthesis for someone who English is a second language, or maybe has a hearing impairment and can't hear certain frequencies? So, so because those have different frustrations. The product, any product that solves those frustrations is, is gonna have to do that differently. And so the experience that we're talking about here is really key. And what you keep talking about are the functionality of the product, but the functionality of the product doesn't exist in a vacuum. We, we, have, to, we have to focus in on what is the experience? Is the experience of synthesis uh, the experience used teaching young children how to read? Is it the experience that is happening uh, in a um, uh, uh, a cockpit where you're using voice messaging for alerts and various types of signals? I mean, these are the those are very different experiences. So the so whatever product you build has to be different. But the experience isn't new. Cockpits have had alerts since the first planes were created. We've been teaching children how to read since we invented children. So there's uh, 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 all we're doing is adapting products into existing experiences. There is no notion of new when you focus on the human experience. It, all this has happened before and all this will happen again. Right, so, so but in the sense of that first, you know, taking a picture of what's happening in the current experience, I guess I was wondering what, uh, how does that change or does that change? Are there situations where that part of the process changes? I think that's kind of what- Not I'm really. Thinking. Because whatever you produce has to be better than what's out there, mm. yeah. right? If it's not an improvement over what's out there, why are you building it? Right. So then in that picture, then we're just talking about things that are happening before or after, kind of like what you were talking about, looking at the experience beyond just that little zeroing in on experience with whatever software. You right. You, you, you want to focus on the solution, but I'm telling you, the problems that you have to solve are completely tied to the current experience and the current experience is not yeah. tied to the solution yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. Cool, no, I, th I think you answered my question, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. That, that's, uh, uh, I'm glad I was able to pull that off. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Angela, who should we talk to next? Um, we have a question from Susan Curry, Suzanne Curry, I'm sorry. And their question is that they've been mashing up journey maps and leans value stream maps that define the value from a variety of perspectives. Then uh, we can evaluate the value of the journey slash stream against a human-centered de definition of value. Then there's a gap. 
What advice do you have for representing that gap? Oh, that's interesting. Suzanne, can you say more about where your gap comes from? Yeah, you bet. Um, the gap comes from, well, it could come in a number of ways, but it could come in the evaluation of the quality of the journey against um, an ideal future or an ideal experience in the wild. Like products and services are not necessarily in the wild. They may be used in the wild. They themselves don't come from the wild, right? Out there in the world. Okay. And so we define, we're attempting to define value uh, to someone's life as they live it, you know, weaving into the fabric of, of their lives and all the reality that that entails. And so there can be quite a gap. I'm working in um, a severe mental illness and substance use disorder, quite a gap between life lived in the wild and the problems that are experienced there. And then the value that a company is, is trying to achieve. Okay. But the value isn't what the company's trying to achieve. The value is the improvement to someone's life. That is the value. You're right. And so there can be quite a gap. And the gap can be, um, can result in impacts in common everyday scenarios and frequent but important scenarios, rare and critical scenarios. And so just trying to think about how to represent that gap so that the um the impact on people's lives is clearer and so that it it creates that enthusiasm for making the changes and solving the problems right but you have to start with the experience that people are having yeah 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 that's the journey okay so the experience that people are having they're they're, they're journeys yeah, journeys, infinite journeys. There are not just a few. Right. Well, there's a finite number of people, so there's a finite number of journeys. <laughs> it could be a very large number. Okay. <laughs> but but um, uh, but it, it, so it may feel infinite. Uh, but it's the it's the patterns in the journeys that we're most interested in, because any given solution has to probably. Uh, uh, until we get to some future where we can make everything unique, uh, any given solution yeah. has to has to be um, uh, 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 created um, uh, to match um, multiple peoples. Uh, it's funny. I was having this conversation just this morning because I have a lot of customers who work in government. And uh, in the commercial world, you try and figure out what are the common attributes of the, of the people who would be most profitable to the organization so that you can build a solution that matches their needs enough that they're willing to exchange money for your service. So that's, you know, the, the, the notion of value is the amount of money that they're willing to exchange for the service. So, uh, um, uh, and then you work outwards from that group, trying to get more and more people in that group that you're serving to then therefore generate more value. Uh, in government, you actually look for the people who, uh, have been historically marginalized, who've been historically ignored, and you focus on for which government is doing a crappy, crappy job of meeting their needs, and you work your way in. You, 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 you try to get to, you know, we don't have to help the rich people. We have to help all the people who can't solve every problem with money. Uh, uh, unless, of course, we're we're buying out a failed bank, but yeah. the, uh, um, uh, the the uh, the this uh, notion of of value 
is is that what we're really just trying to do is understand where what are the problems to solve so i think what you're talking about as the gap is what i'm talking about as the problems we have to solve that haven't been solved yet i think you're right I yeah. think that is yeah, yeah. totally no i think you're right and representing them as you know because we use jobs to be done right and in jobs to be it's just you know it's a common language and approach and so that's got its intelligence to leverage and uh, what's nice about jobs to be done is that there can be a variety of outcomes, functional, social, emotional. And I think the the problems can, you know, be in those areas as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, jobs to be done has severe flaws, but but whatever you're using, you, you want to focus on the improvement you're making to people's lives. Yeah. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we we have time for a few more questions. So if you have questions, just put them in in the chat. Uh, label them question for Jared. That way, Angela will know uh, uh, that it's for me and not just a question for the community at, as a whole. Uh, Angela, do we have another question? We do. Um, Lisa Rose uh, says, "Are e the value? How do you translate, or how have you translated?" delight into a dollar figure for the exec whose only question is how much more will we make or lose by taking the time to do this essential research? Oh, that's an interesting question. Lisa, can you, can you uh, elaborate on that? Um, gosh, I, I, I think you touched on it just a little bit ago when you were talking about value. Um, so, yeah, how, how, how do you convince somebody that they, uh, I'm thinking about people I've worked for who have I totally get this. They, they get that idea of, um, you know, the user, the, the ex experience needs to be delightful. They, you know, they're the, the measure of success, their experience, but um, they're not going to do anything unless they see that it tr it is quantifiable in dollars and cents. How do you quantify this? Um, um, or how have you done that? Well, there's a bunch of ways well, to do it. There's a bunch of ways to do it. Um, one, um, one, one, one thing that we can do uh, is... We can look at the, so one of the things to, that, that's really important that I think a lot of people don't realize is that every product or service has an experience associated with it, right? It already exists. People, you know, if you are, if you're not paying attention uh, to the, um, uh, to the experience that that uh, you're delivering in the products or services you produce, then chances are it's not a very good experience. Nobody creates great experiences accidentally. So what that means is is that the experience you're having is likely to be a a, a poor experience. And since it's likely to be a poor experience, the uh, poor experiences have this unusual attribute, which is that they almost always cost the organization money. Uh, when people are having a poor experience, they call support. When they are... Uh, can't figure something out, they need some sort of training. They give up with the product or service and switch to somebody else, you lose sales. Uh, you deliver features that nobody uses, you're spending money on waste. All of these things create problems for the organization. And so one place you can start is by calculating what are usually ongoing costs 
from poor UX and talk about how those costs are unnecessary. If we fix the experience, then um, that's a one-time fee. But if people keep calling support over and over again because something in the design is not obvious or clear and they don't know how to use it for its purpose, uh, those are ongoing costs and they add up. And they can add up to be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. So that's one way to express it. Uh, the other is to, is to look at, you know, the, the, the change between the, the current experience and uh, the, uh, the better future because that change between what we keep delivering if we don't do the research versus what could be better if we did the work, that, that difference there, that vision that we outline, that is what we have to, to understand, right? And usually we don't have to work too hard to imagine this. We don't, we can, uh, we can take the evidence that the organization already has about what people are frustrated by, what people are asking for, what other competitors are doing in the market. And we can talk to a future that is dramatically improved over the, the future we will have if we just keep doing what we're doing. And if we do a good job of describing this, it'll be blatantly obvious why people would want it. And if we can, if we can talk about why people want it, the money opportunity is there because anything people desperately want, they'll pay for. I mean, that's the, that's the underlying premise of capitalism. So uh, uh, we can, it's usually, it doesn't take a lot of convincing. The issue is, is that if nobody has an imagination as to what the better product could be, it probably means that the product really doesn't have a purpose in the world. And that's the thing that I see that, that teams get into trouble is that they have actually created a solution for which there are no problems. Uh, an example of this might be blockchain. Uh, or, you know, chat GPT. It, these are things that, that are solutions looking for a problem. Does that make sense, Lisa? It does, totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, I, I've worked when, on enough junk. <laughs> I understand. Yep. <laughs> uh, so how does that change your thinking on this? Um, it doesn't change my thinking. It sort of confirms my thinking, actually. Okay. Okay. Oh, that works. <laughs> Thank oh, that you. Works. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Jared. Wonderful. <laughs> okay. Uh, Angela, do we have another question here? Yes, we do. And um, please correct me if I mispronounce the questioner's name. Uh, Shaul Nemetsov? Uh, their question is, how do you reconcile trying to improve people's lives and do your job as a UX professional to satisfy stakeholders? Uh, uh, Shaul, can, can you say more about this? Did we get your name close? Uh, you'll probably need to unmute. I don't, uh, I don't know if you can unmute or not. I invited Shaul to un unmute. Okay. We'll see if he can um, uh, Okay, well in the chat he wrote, uh, uh, often the company wants the UX solution but not really beneficial for the user. Well, uh, uh, 
it's a privileged perspective to say, why do they need UX people at that point? Um, it's not really a UX solution if it's not beneficial to the user. It's just a, it's just a, a different uh, implementation. So um, uh, there's uh, my, my thinking is that uh, there is no difference here. There's nothing to reconcile between improving people's lives and satisfying stakeholders. Uh, you know, there's plenty of other people in the company who, uh, 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 who, who will work to, um, uh, to just do what stakeholders want and not care about what the users need. This is not what UX people bring to the table. It's sort of like hiring salespeople, but not letting them actually sell anything. It, it, it's, it's not a good use of resources. Um, that's my take, but that's, um, that is a privileged perspective. Uh, uh, not everybody has the choice to be able to go off and change jobs after they discover that that what's what they're being asked to do is not what they thought they would be asked to do, uh, but uh, the reality is, is I think, and there's plenty of evidence that despite the fact the slew of layoffs that have been happening lately, um, the market for UX people has been growing tremendously. And these are organizations that actually do see value in having better user experiences. They just don't know how to envision what that looks like. And that's, that's what we're trying to do here is to, is to, is to paint that picture. Okay. Um, we do have time for another question if somebody has one. I don't know if- Last call, last call. Uh, uh, if we have any more, but uh, uh, the um, uh, I do invite you to come uh, be a part of our Leaders of Awesomeness community, which uh, if you're on the YouTube, uh, the easiest way to find it is to, to just Google uh, Leaders of Awesomeness, and it should be one of the first results in the, in the list. Uh, and um, uh, uh, this is uh, the, the link to it um, I've put into the chat in Zoom, uh, you can feel free to, to sign up and uh, be a part of, of that, and it's free. So Jared, I'm gonna jump in with a question that's not directly about what you've been speaking about now, but maybe some of the people in the Zoom room are unfamiliar with how UIE and Center Center are connected and disconnected. Mostly. Oh, well, we're Mostly. one company. They're, now they're, we're one company, okay. Yes, yeah, we've been one company since 2016. Uh, uh, they're both companies that I helped start um, uh, uh, because um, I had too much free time, but I've solved that problem now. Good. <laughs> but, uh, but both companies basically are professional development or the one company is now professional development center center was created to start a UX design school, which we, which we launched in 2016. And, um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, and, uh, UIE, which has been around since 1988, uh, was, uh, created to do professional development for organizations to help them 
uh, deliver better design products and services. And so it was a natural marriage of the, of the two businesses, um, uh, one to help people new to the field and the other to help people who've been in the field. So uh, those are the, th that's, that's what we do. And we talk about UX strategy and UX education and all the things of that nature. Great, thanks. Okay, folks. Uh, yeah. I think I'm gonna call it. I really appreciate Jared, you're staying up late with us because I know it's almost midnight where you are and I don't want to see you turn into a pumpkin. So I'm going to let you go. And I appreciate very much you're making your fourth appearance on the Bake High stage with us this evening. And I look forward to uh, hearing more from you soon. Perhaps on a Monday. Thank you very much for encouraging my behavior. You bet. And thank you okay. all for showing up too. And we had uh, people who stayed for the whole time. That was a big group that stayed for the whole time. So thanks. Yeah. Next month, second Tuesday of the month, we'll be here. Join us. Thank you very much.